a thousand miles along the Peruvian coast of South America, reaching inland between lush valleys to the Andes, lies a rainless tropical desert where the blinding heat of the sun has helped to preserve rich relics of an ancient culture. Long before the Spanish made it their base for the conquest of the New World, theories of civilizations which far predated history. Today, Peru is a land of dramatic contrast, the colorful scene for our investigation of the mystery of the Incas. As an exceptional favor, the government of Peru allows us to begin our journey by a visit to the closely guarded Guano Islands, where countless millions of seabirds provide one of the nation's greatest sources of wealth. This string of rocky islands scattered along the Peruvian coast has for numberless centuries been a safe haven for the birds of the Pacific Ocean. A dozen different species are found among the islands, each with its favorite nesting place. Eagles like the narrow ledges on the cliffs, and the air is filled with their raucous cries. But the ones that darken the skies when they soar upward from their nesting grounds, the birds which constitute the great wealth of the islands, are the guanai. It is late in the day now, and many of the birds have already left for the feeding grounds, where they will feed upon schools of small fish. Even now, so many of the birds remain on the island that they are crowded closely together, so densely packed in some places that they are unable to take flight at our approach. This coastal region of Peru is one of the driest areas in the world. Rain falls perhaps once in a man's lifetime. For this reason, the deposits left by the birds have remained on the islands down through the centuries, forming what is called guano, a rich and extremely valuable agricultural fertilizer. In this strange location, we find a dodge part of the equipment sent out to aid in the harvest of a new crop of guano. A deposit like this seven feet deep is now a rare find. Millions of tons of guano have been removed from the island over a period of many years. The cost of labor is so little and the value of the fertilizer so great that the guano is dusted off the bedrock with brushes. This work could hardly be described as pleasant since the guano produces pungent fumes of ammonia. When gathered from the rocks, the guano is packed into bags. The loading operation is primitive and picturesque as the bags are transferred to barges. Reloaded into cargo steamers, the fertilizer will be shipped to the remotest points along the Pacific coast of South America. Among these same islands, we find a colony of sea lions sunning themselves upon a secluded beach. We try to sneak in quietly for a camera close-up, but the leaders of the herd see us coming and sound a warning. As the sea lions scurry away to safety, we determine to accept the challenge. We'll get those pictures somehow before we leave the islands. Soon we discover a smaller group in a well-hidden tidal pool. And again, we move in cautiously and quietly with our camera to get as close as possible without owning them. This time, we're more successful. Just as we are about to return to the mainland, we find on one of the Guano Islands a rock almost completely covered with sea lions. We count more than 400 of them, basking on the rock, swimming and courting in the surrounding water. We watch them for a long time. Then one of them catches sight of us, sounds the alarm, and they dive headlong from the rocks into the sea. Back on the mainland, we begin our search for the remains of ancient civilizations. Once, a tremendous population existed along this sun-baked coast, and wherever we go, we find relics preserved by the desert sand. Here, you see me digging up the mummy of what was probably a poor fisherman, wrapped in cheap cotton batty. Sometimes, these burial sites yield far richer textiles and other archaeological treasures. Extensive excavations for archaeological remains have been made at Ancon, about 25 miles north of the city of Lima. Because of the fine bathing beaches and excellent fishing, the area is gradually being converted into a seaside resort, 
But in the meantime, the investigation of pre-Spanish burial grounds is supervised by an archaeologist from the National Museum at Lima. Here, the archaeologist is showing me the construction of the tombs. The twigs which support the sand for the roof are still in perfect condition, although they were laid in position five or six hundred years ago. Each tomb contains a mummy wrapped in textiles, together with pottery used to contain food for the journey through the other world. This pottery is the basic source material for archaeological research. However poor, each tomb is carefully investigated. As it is opened, careful notes are made of everything found. Each object is numbered and catalogued to be shipped later to the National Museum of Archaeology at Lima. Of considerable scientific interest is the fact that the hair on the skulls of most of the mummies is still in good condition. This is, of course, due to the preservative action of the sand and the dry, rainless atmosphere. To these simple factors of climate, students of these ancient civilizations owe a debt of gratitude. From Ancon, we go southward to beautiful Lima, capital of Peru. Our objective here is the National Museum of Archaeology, which is also known as the Inca Museum. With our curiosity aroused by the excavations we saw at Ancon, we are lucky to arrive at a time when the museum staff is busy preparing a series of watercolors of some of their most interesting exhibits. It is interesting to us to discover that many of the animals depicted in this pottery from the coastal area are animals of the jungle across the Andes, many hundreds of miles distant. This means that the coastal tribes must have had constant contact with the people of the jungle, and that, as a matter of fact, many of the jungle animals must have been kept as pets in the coastal communities. The visitor to Lima's National Museum is convinced by the evidence of his own eyes that these ancient relics comprise one of the richest, the finest, and most complete collections of artistic objects to be found anywhere in the world. Unrivaled and priceless are the specimens of pottery, textiles, jewelry, and other archaeological treasures from the Inca civilization and those which came earlier. No later civilizations, even those of today, can boast of finer craftsmanship, greater artistry, or more fertile imagination. One of the birds most often represented in the ceramics and textiles of the coastal area is the toucan a jungle bird whose grotesque beak and brilliant coloring must have been a challenge to the artists of the distant seaboard. The finest of the textiles in the museum at Lima are those found wrapped around mummies from the burial ground at Paracas. Some of these mummies were swathed in the most beautiful woven and embroidered materials much of which is still in a remarkable state of preservation. Those fabrics which were imperfectly preserved can often be saved by being carefully attached to a stronger backing material. This delicate operation is the responsibility of expert needle workers who are members of the museum staff. Remarkable ingenuity and artistic ability are displayed in the design, the weaving, and the embroidery of these magnificent textiles. Typical of the local designs is this one of a man who carries in his right hand a shrunken human head, an object still produced by the headhunters of the remote parts of Peru. Some effort is being made to keep alive the tradition of these handicrafts of old Peru. This is one of the workshops established in Lima and in Cuzco by Truman Bailey under the auspices of our own Office of Inter-American Affairs. In these workshops, pupils are trained in the old arts, most of their inspiration being derived from objects in the museum at Lima. The museum exhibits are first used as models from which the pupils make copies in order to become familiar with the old designs and methods of working. Later, as they become more adept at craftsmanship in leather, metal, clay, or wood, the pupils are encouraged to develop their own designs based on the sound inspiration of the ancient artisans. Here, one young artist is beginning the making of a tray, hammering the native silver into shape with the same techniques employed centuries ago by one of his ancestors.
One works in copper, shaping his tray in the form of a jungle leaf. Another works in wood, carving a meticulous copy of an ancient relic, perhaps one of those we saw in the great National Museum at Lima. Once more headed inland on the trail of the Incas, we climb a chain of the Andes over precipitous slopes by one of the most wonderfully engineered roads in the world. At an altitude of nearly 11,000 feet, we enter the valley in which lies the thriving town of Huancayo. Sunday is market day in Huancayo, and Indians from nearby villages and even from remote mountains take possession of the principal plaza and the main street to offer their wares for sale. Here are dye stuffs used in the making of ponchos and embroideries. Here is the dyed wool, ready to be spun into thread and woven into colorful fabrics. The costumes which we see about the marketplace are fully as interesting as the astonishing variety of objects offered for sale. Here we find beautiful embroidery in traditional patterns which date back through the centuries. We can buy carved and decorated gourds, bargain for colorful armlets, or even invest in a pair of socks. It would in fact be quite a task to catalog all the different kinds of articles which can be purchased in this amazing and festive marketplace. And festive it is. Well, the Sunday market fair at Huancayo is in some ways very much like the more familiar county fair of our own country. We can almost expect to hear the voice of a sideshow barker. What we do discover to our amazement is a ventriloquist and his dummy, whose hilarious antics need no translation. A Peruvian Charlie McCarthy performing in a street laid out by the Incas a century and a half before Columbus discovered America. Continuing southward, we come at last to Cuzco, capital city of the Incas, where lies revealed the mystery of their ancient empire. Here we see for the first time the marvelous stonework, which is an enduring monument to a great civilization. The snake and jaguar carved in stone are the signature of the Inca architects. Their masonry is the most perfect ever known. They use no mortar, no cement. Each stone is perfectly shaped to fit into its appointed place. Here we find typical Spanish architecture and decoration added to the ancient masonry. When the Spaniards arrived on their march of conquest, they found it difficult to destroy the massive stonework of the Incas, so they left the walls standing and built upon them as a foundation. On our way to visit the fortification which rises above the city of Cuzco, we come upon an old Inca highway. And here we seize the opportunity to drive our Dodge Power Wagon over stones which may have been laid as much as a thousand years ago. The Incas were not, as you might assume, a race or a people. They were members of a fantastic family, which for six centuries ruled an empire so rich that its fame attracted the attention of Spaniards greedy for conquest and for gold. Here is a real contrast for you. We leave the ancient Inca roadway and our wheels roll over the ultra-modern Pan-American Highway, which will someday reach from New York to Buenos Aires. One of the most astonishing monuments to any people of history is the great fortress of Sacsayhuaman, constructed by the Incas to guard their city of Cusco. No one knows how many hundreds of years or how many thousands of men it took to build this structure, but we do know that it completely failed of its purpose. When the Spaniards came, the fortress surrendered without resistance. Notice the size of the individual stones. The one behind the Dodge Power Wagon must weigh hundreds of tons. We have no idea how these gigantic stones were brought to their present location. We know that they were cut and shaped in quarries which are as much as five or seven miles away from the fortress. But no one has been able to determine how they were transported and finally lifted into position in the walls. Because abandoned stones have been discovered in the quarries, we know that all cutting and shaping was done before they were brought to the building site. The stones were shaped with such extraordinary accuracy that they fit perfectly in place without mortar. You can't force a knife blade into the cracks between them. 
I'm six feet three inches tall, and you can use me as a yardstick to measure this specimen. It's about 12 feet square. Even the Spaniards who wrecked the fortress to build their own houses could not move such stones as this. A few miles from Saxawaman, in a region rich in architectural relics of the Incas, we come upon another monument. This one, a great circle of stones surrounding a monolith, reminds us of the ancient Druid temples of England. The atmosphere of mystery pervading this area is deepened by dramatic skies which precede a tropical squall. Forty-five miles north of Cusco, we visit one of the greatest units in the chain of defense of the Inca Empire, the fortress of Ollantaytambo. Here the style of architecture is quite different from that found near Cusco, although the stonework is equally remarkable and there is much evidence of skill and ingenuity. Here are the ruins of an old bridge which spanned the river in the days of the Incas. From the opposite side of the river, we have a distant view of the fortress perched on a hill. Here, seven miles away from Ollantaytambo, is the quarry from which came the stones for the fortress walls. So far as we know, the only metal tools possessed by the Incan stone cutters were small bronze chisels a few inches long. Yet somehow, they cut the huge stones, shaped them accurately, and moved them 3,000 feet down one mountain and 1,500 feet up another. Looking down from Machu Picchu to the bottom of the valley, we can appreciate the difficulty faced by Bingham in reaching the city after natives had brought stories of its location. A railroad and highway have improved the situation for tourists, but even today the last few miles are afoot or horseback over a trail six feet wide. When Hiram Bingham returned to Machu Picchu after an absence of 32 years, he was received as a guest of the Peruvian government, showered with honors of all kinds. But when I met him, I quickly realized that what meant most to him was this opportunity to show his charming wife the scene of his youthful adventures of 1911. Few men can look back upon a lifetime of such great and varied achievement. I had the great pleasure of hearing from Hiram Bingham some of the story of the ancient city of Machu Picchu and how he came to find it after it had been abandoned for 400 years. It seems that a French explorer heard rumors of the existence of the ruins when he was in Peru in 1850, and he recorded the rumors in a book of his adventures. Inspired by the written report, Bingham secured the help of natives, carried out the search, and finally achieved success. Here is the stone to which Inca priests solemnly tied the sun on the shortest day of every year, thus reassuring the Indians who feared the sun would disappear. The famous Temple of the Sun is one of the most remarkable structures of Machu Picchu. Beneath it is a large chamber which is supposed to have contained a sacrificial altar. The three great windows of the temple are said to symbolize the windows through which four brothers emerged to found the city of Cusco. From the mountainside high above Machu Picchu, our towards the magnificent natural setting of the mysterious lost city of the Incas. It is easy to see why even the Indians of the mountains were unaware of the city's existence for many generations. From Machu Picchu, we go many miles away across the border of Bolivia to the site of an even earlier civilization, the ruins of Tiahuanaco. Most spectacular of the monuments of the pre-Incan people of Tiahuanaco is the series of monolithic structures hewn from slabs of solid rock they are carved with decorative designs which are remarkably intricate.
Some of the sculpture at Tiahuanaco is a form of writing, part of which has been deciphered by archaeologists. The Incas had no written language, but the people of this earlier civilization apparently knew much that was later forgotten. They possessed a knowledge of metals, which is apparent from a study of the architecture of the period. The heavy stones which went into the walls and monuments of Tiahuanaco were held together by means of metal keys. The bars of metal have themselves disappeared, but the hollows made to receive them in the blocks of stone can still be clearly seen. In the neighborhood of Tiahuanaco, we find, as we did near Inca ruins, what the natives call tired stones, stones which were for some reason abandoned on their way from quarry to construction site. Continuing on the trail of the Incas, we return to Peru and visit one of the many remote villages in the region near Cusco and Machu Picchu. Much of the language, the costumes, the dances, and the music of these people goes straight back to the Inca civilization or even earlier. The plaza of the village is the center of activity where all business transactions take place. In the background, we see the remains of a wall erected by the Incas. Yamas take the place of horses, which could not survive in these high altitudes. To the Indians, they are more than beasts of burden. They are pets and practically members of the family. Money is rarely seen in the village plaza, where almost all trading is carried on by means of barter. Each Sunday, hundreds of Indians from nearby smaller villages come to such market centers as this, bringing vegetables, fruit, livestock, clothing, and all kinds of handicraft products to be displayed for sale. The custom of the weekly market day probably dates back as far as the ancient stonework, which we find scattered among the later Spanish colonial buildings of the village. The traditional costumes of the natives are most colorful and interesting. The large hats, or monteras, are decorated by Inca symbols, which sometimes denote whether a girl is married or single. The men wear hats called chuyos, which are mainly useful to protect them from the cold. Some of the hats and other clothing we see here may be hundreds of years old, for one of the closely guarded secrets of the Incas was the making of dyes which do not fade for centuries. The ponchos, which are made and worn by the Indians, are handsomely woven and decorated with intricate patterns of embroidery. We find our sales resistance dropping rapidly as we wander about the marketplace. I despair of finding anything that will fit me, but my son David invests in a magnificent tabla casaca. This is the full dress costume of the Indians, which corresponds to our formal dinner coat or tuxedo. The owner of the shop grins in amusement as I try to find something that will fit. A poncho seems to be the answer because it doesn't have to fit. It's a sort of combination raincoat and overcoat with a hole in the middle to slip over the head. The son of the shopkeeper is all dressed up. And after a while, my wife and David are also completely outfitted in authentic Inca fashions. My wife wears what is called a Wally skirt part of the costume worn by the Indian women on dress-up occasions. So we complete our shopping expedition and move on. At Chincheros, we find a group of musicians playing on the tipsy, an instrument adapted from the Spanish guitar, and on a 46-string harp called charango. Both of these instruments were copied from those played by the Spanish colonists. To their accompaniment, dancers perform one of the oldest of the traditional dances handed down from Inca days, the dance of the Tinka. In the postures of their dance and the words they sing, the performers offer thanks to the sun god, to Mother Earth, and to all nature for life and all its blessings. The three dancers in red ponchos are selected by the people as guardians of the peace. Here is another dance of ceremony. This one is a celebration of victory in warfare. The costumes and the figures of the dance are exactly as they were centuries ago, when a great empire welded together dozens of tribes over a great area under the leadership of a family or clan of priests and rulers called the Incas.
it's quite certain that these ceremonial dances and even the music to which they are set comprise the oldest living remnants of the lost civilizations of Peru. a pin which is centuries old and extremely valuable. Made of gold and silver, it is engraved with symbols indicate that the girl is engaged. Everybody takes part in one or another of these dances, many of which closely resemble the square dances of our southern and western states. The music of the old guitars and harps is also somewhat like the hillbilly and cowboy melodies that we hear every day on records and radios. Even onlookers who are not performing dances or playing instruments seem always to enjoy the show. This dance is called Pirawa, a name closely allied to the term pirouette in the ballet. The Pirawa is a very old dance, still popular in the native schools of Peru. There is also an occasional resemblance to a Native American dance, which was, I believe, called uh, trucking. An important ceremony is the drinking of a chicha, the sacred liquor of the Incas. Passed from hand to hand, as all drink from the same cup, the chicha becomes a symbol of friendship and peace. A mixture of colonial Spanish and Inca influences is responsible for this dance, which is called wino. Although it embodies steps and movements very like our jitterbug routines and boogie-woogie tempos, this also is a traditional dance which was the latest rage about 400 years ago. Long before the Spaniards came, these same dances and costumes were to be seen in this same village plaza. The same language and music and songs were to be heard. Here, among the descendants of an ancient civilization, we are for a moment transported backward in time to the days of the Incas. In our journey back to the Pacific coast and our return to America, we take with us indelible impressions of a great vanished civilization. Someday, perhaps, we shall return to the high mountains, the arid plateaus, and the thick matted jungles of Peru to continue our fascinating pursuit of the mystery of the Incas. Once more, we take you with us on a journey of exploration, wheels across the Andes, from the Pacific coast of Ecuador, across the high backbone of South America, to the sky-high waters of Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, and the survivors of an ancient civilization in historic Peru. Much of our journey is through the most mountainous country in the world. Much of it is good roads, superbly engineered and safe. 
much is not good. After rainstorms, it is almost impassable. Sometimes, indeed, a riverbed is better than the road. Now we are on our way toward the jungle. In a few hours, we shall be down into timbered country, into green and moist valleys and misty lowlands. We plan to visit an amazing tribe of jungle Indians, the Colorados, who live deep in the rain forest. We have left all roads behind us. Against all advice, my son David boasts that if I will let him take his time, he will drive into the Colorado country. Well, here he is, taking his time and not a bit discouraged. He may have slowed down a bit, but he's still moving. Here is our first Colorado Indian, obviously on his way to the little town we have just left. The world over, the American cigarette is a symbol of goodwill and friendship, an easy introduction. Now let me explain this fellow's appearance. That's not a hat or a helmet on his head, it's his own hair, plastered down with a sticky red coloring matter called achiote. Colorado means red, and achiote is what makes the Colorados red. His hands are not dirty, they're dyed blue. He's not particularly dressed up. This is the everyday costume of a Colorado. You can see that his teeth also are dyed black. I try to make him show us his dental decorations a little more clearly, but he seems to be both high-strung and ticklish. Here are a father and son whose nerves are under better control. Hippolyte and Ramon are their names. Hippolyte, who speaks a few words of Spanish, will be a valuable friend and advisor during our stay with the Colorados. He is greatly impressed by the Dodge Power Wagon, but he says it's useless to try to push on with the cars. We have a broad river to cross and must go on foot. He promises to meet us with horses on the other side of the river. To impress Hippolyte still further, I try to make him listen and talk over the radio telephone, which provides communication with our base camp. But he doesn't get the idea at all and it's beyond my abilities to explain it to him in his native language. What he and Ramon want is a fast ride in the power wagon, and this they get. So we proceed on foot through the jungle of our childhood dream. Gorgeously colorful, steamy and mysterious, smelling like a hothouse, alive with a million sounds of birds and insects. Out of the tangle of undergrowth through which we cut our way, trees rise to what seems a fantastic height above us. We come to the river which Hippolyte said we would have to cross. He told us there would be a bridge dusk, we find the bridge, an insecure contraption of steel cable and tree branches. The broad river rushing over its rocky bed, the threatening jungle on either side, the sky heavy with the darkening clouds of an approaching storm. This is one of the most memorable scenes in all my experience. The next morning, we find Hippolyte faithful to his promise with our horses. And with him are his wife Philomena and his Rosita. This is the way in which long years ago, travelers and explorers, missionaries and traders, made journeys sometimes of many weeks through the hot and healthy jungle. Personally, I'm more at home at the wheel of a car. I'm glad that I waited to be born until the age of the automobile. When we have set up camp, the mere routine of peeling potatoes fills the Colorados with amazement. They watch our simplest activities with endless curiosity. A source of never-to-be-forgotten wonder is one of our cameras. 
On the ground glass focusing screen, they see the whole camp alive and upside down. Meanwhile, Ippolit's people in their turn are demonstrating for us the manner of the Colorado's daily life. I am fascinated by these Indians of unknown origin and history, of whom there are said to be less than 1,000 left. They are a sturdy and independent people who clearly do not wish to adopt any other tribe's dress or way of living. Their faces reflect a strong individuality, in sharp contrast to other Indian tribes of this region. They are far indeed from being primitives. They have their own arts and crafts, know how to spin, dye, and weave wool, and make their own garments. The Colorados build simple but ingenious and efficient presses to squeeze out the juice of the sugar cane, which they cultivate in jungle clearings. This, like all their activities, is a family affair. With the leaves removed, the sugarcane stalks are fed one by one between the rollers of the machine. Philomena guides them while it takes all the strength of Hippolyte and Ramon to turn the rollers against the heavy pressure. In this machine, there is not a nail or a piece of metal, but it does its work. The tough, fibrous cane is crushed. A simple banana leaf with a hole through the center collects the sweet solution to fill the homemade earthenware jar. People with so much ingenuity and skill could easily develop a more complex way of life along the lines of what we call progress. But the Colorados do not seem to wish to do so. They seem to prefer to go their own unsophisticated way. Why not? The jungle gives them all they need. Presently, visitors arrive for a fiesta to celebrate our coming. Colorados are ever full of surprises. The musical instrument they carry is what they call a marimba, but I recognize it immediately as a Central African xylophone. Polidor, the witch doctor, is another of our good friends. He shows us the achiote seeds and how easy it is to obtain from them the red dye with which the Indians paint their faces and their bodies. Using the mirror we gave him, he applies a new coat of paint. And next, he shows us how to insert a matchstick into the hole which every Colorado has on the tip of his nose. Everyone is busy dressing up. The blue dye also comes from a plant and is apparently especially favored by the women. But it's the red achiote dye which gets into everything, even the puppy dog. Courtesy demands that the leader of the expedition should also be decorated. Unfortunately, the red paint caused a painful irritation, and it took a week for the blue stripes to wear off. We have set up sound recording equipment to record the playing of the marimba. I am intrigued by this instrument, born in the depths of the Congo in Africa, which was carried centuries ago to the west coast of Ecuador which has now penetrated unchanged so far into this alien jungle. The Colorados have watched us work without a flicker of understanding. But now we are playing back to them the recording we have just made. Music which they just heard being played is now coming out of this box. And it seems to them to be a wondrous deed of gods or demons. It is the older people who look like children among the Colorados. And the children like our little Rosita, who look as the adults should. Meanwhile, David has made good his boast and triumphantly brings the power wagon all the way into camp. He has brought with him wonders which the jungle children have never seen. They are overcome with shyness. Some of the youngsters happily experiment with the sweets and toys. The 
little girls shyly play with a doll, a blue-eyed doll made in Sweden, the only doll I could find in the city of Quito. Back on the road again, a road boldly cut out of the rock, out of the walls of ravines and canyons. We are crossing one of the two main chains of the Andes, the Cordillera Negra, the Black Cordillera. We have climbed at last above the highest rail point to bleak summits with pockets of snow. Finally, just under the snow line, we reach the top of the pass itself. A breathtaking panorama of snow-capped mountains is now before us. The Cordillera Blanca, or White Cordillera. As we descend again to the valley of Huaylas, we get nearer and nearer to the Peruvian giants of the Andes. Most spectacular of all, Huascaran, 22,000 feet high. Evening falls, the twilight glow slowly invades the great snow peaks. A few days later, we start out to climb a mountain, one of the many minor peaks around us. It is unnamed on the maps and probably still unclimbed. We have all had bad cases of soroche, mountain sickness, since we reached these unusual altitudes. Some people suffer so distressingly from Sorace that they cannot remain at all in these high valleys of the Andes. Most travelers get very sick for a few days and then gradually adapt themselves. This has been the case with us. The present outing is to celebrate our recovery as well as to serve as training for the future. Our first day has been good, but now the weather clearly is spoiling. By the time we have made camp, snow is falling and the prospect is gloomy for tomorrow. Next morning, snow is still falling. It is bitterly cold, although we are within a few miles of the equator. Coffee and hot oatmeal for breakfast. We start off with little hope of a clearing of the fog, but we have climbed only a few hundred feet when the clouds lift. The edge of the glacier, clear ice, deep blue, treacherous under a fresh layer of snow, broken with many glittering crevasses and caves, and pools of milky blue water. The crossing of the glacier requires the utmost caution. Almost on the slope, with the top in clear sight, we have our only near accident. Half an hour later, the last steps are cut. The last few feet are covered. And the top is reached. We fly a great deal on this trip. Everyone does in South America, most air-minded of continents. Sometimes for hours we zoom low over the immense, unbroken, haunting, frightening green hell of the Amazon jungle. 
And again, with oxygen, we soar at 18, 20, or 24,000 feet over the Andes. Always when we fly over near the great icy peaks, I look for one thing. Just under the snow line, the clearly marked pathways, mysterious and fascinating to me. Who made these paths? No Indians of today live that high, no wild animals. These worn pathways at the edge of the snow are a riddle which I long to solve. On the high plateaus of Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina, llamas carry loads at 16,000 feet and more. Herds of alpacas supply wool. Here, wild vicernas roam, seldom seen. But we had luck one morning and got these pictures. These animals, relatives of the camel, are built for altitude. Their lungs and hearts are far larger, their blood more abundant, and far richer in red cells than that of most animals. A little tame vicuna was brought to us one day, a graceful and delicate thing, and for a while it was the expedition's mascot. That it was especially constructed to live at high altitudes proved not to handicap it in the least when later we brought it to sea level. It is today living happily with some of our good friends in Lima. In the Peruvian capital, I found the government concerned with the same problem which intrigued me, that of adaptation to life at high altitudes. I found that Peruvian doctors had done pioneer work in research in this field. I told them of some of the things that had most astonished me, of the spirited game of association football which I had seen played by Indian mine workers on a sodden field at an altitude of nearly 16,000 feet. I could scarcely drag myself around in the thin air, and yet after a lively game, the players had shown no sign of strain. The doctors told me those mountain Indians, like the Yama and Vicuna, have enormously enlarged lungs, more blood, blood far richer in red cells than the Indians of the plains. We have traveled the boundary of Peru to Lake Titicaca. It is not only the largest lake in South America, but it is by far the highest navigable lake in the world with an altitude of 12,644 feet. Imagine a lake 140 miles long and 69 miles wide on top of Pikes Peak. To live comfortably around this beautiful lake, you must take care to be born and raised here. For only in this way can you grow the necessary Superman lungs and blood supply. The city of La Paz, the highest city in the world. Denver boasts of being a mile high. La Paz is almost three miles above sea level. In La Paz, they have enough energy to have bullfights, but they are comedy bullfights. I suppose the bulls also have to be raised here to feel equal to this clowning. See that again. Believe it or not, to get to the La Paz airport, you climb 1,000 feet above the city. La Paz airport is the most beautiful I know anywhere, with a backdrop of great mountains. It is the highest commercial airport in the world with an elevation of 14,500 feet. To land and to take off loaded planes in this thin air is not easy, but Panagra's pilots have been doing it daily for many years. We take off with a government medical mission to a place where I'll have a chance to observe research on high altitudes. Hundreds of Indians from the mountains and from plains have had certain characteristics systematically measured and recorded. Here a technician measures the lung capacity of a typical Indian from Titicaca. Over five liters, where the average among the Indians of the lowlands would be scarcely three. A 
group is being put through a measured amount of physical work, two minutes by stopwatch of breaking up hard ground. Immediately after measured exertion, measurements are made of blood pressure and of pulse, for comparison with blood pressure and pulse under conditions of rest. At the request of North American doctors, we make sound recordings of the beating of the heart. We have also been asked for recordings made after extreme exertion. This is the finish of a quarter mile race at 14,000 feet. After this race, blood pressure is almost what would be normal at sea level. A few days later, we have reached a point on the Pan American Highway which I have been impatiently awaiting. Here a road branches off into the mountains. I have convinced myself by many hours of study of maps of Asia and of North and South America at the end of this road is the highest point in the world which can be reached by road. We have borrowed oxygen masks and made up our minds to establish with the power wagon a world record, the altitude record for automobiles. At the end of the road, we pause for final adjustment of the carburetor. Our altimeter, checked by radio, confirms the figure given on the maps. The end of the road is at 17,000 feet. Now we leave the road to climb further. We have set our hearts on reaching an altitude of 18,000 feet. The loose, slippery slope is far from a good surface. We have no special gasoline for this grueling test. The patches of snow throw us off every few yards. Given a road, we could sail right up. Fifty minutes after leaving the end of the road, the needle of the altimeter touches 18,000. It is very decidedly cold up here and we do not linger. It takes us less than 50 minutes to come down again. The region of Cuzco was the center of the old Inca civilization which flourished amazingly in Peru before the coming of the Spaniards. To this day, there lives around Cuzco an Indian population full of character and color with a heritage of traditions dating back to the days of the Incas before the Spanish conquest and Christianization. Pagan and Christian traditions are inextricably mixed. The Indians are deeply religious. Their religion is associated with all their activities. We are attending the yearly fiesta. Saints' Day here on the hacienda of an old country estate. Gaiety and dancing will continue for several days, but the fiesta begins with prayers to the Virgin and to the saints. Absorbed in prayer, rarely conscious of the camera, the Indians present a wonderful variety of types, of costumes, and of emotions. It would be difficult not to be moved by the stillness and the intensity of this scene of devotion. Fiesta will begin as soon as the church service is over. With a small hand camera, we begin to look for candid shots, a gossiping girl with thick black braids, vividly decorated ponchos and hats, characteristic of this region, the cattle buyer for the farm, and his wife, both of them in their Sunday best. And a farmer's wife with a good-humored, weather-beaten face. Music, costumes, and dances, all are old and traditional. The meaning of many of these dances is lost in antiquity. I tried vainly to get an explanation of this one, suggestive, obviously, of whipping. The different masks are readily identified by the spectators. These rounded faces, we are told, represent Indians. 
This group, with its narrow faces, dapper blonde mustaches, pointed noses, and little beards, represent the Spaniards, the conquerors. These creatures with the sheepskin headdresses are, it seems, the wild beasts of the jungle. We've also been told that the woolen mask on the face and the black cross identify the inquisitors. So you can take your choice. But about this group, there can be no doubt. These are the lawyers with their high hats, their books, their inquisitive noses, which seem to be always unhappily covered with warts, and their mannerisms. Traditional and much enjoyed caricature of the legal profession. Their books are all important and constantly consulted. Equally indispensable are their noses necessary to the turning of the pages. This lawyer is putting the young Indian kneeling before him through some solemn initiation. This is the direct way to make knowledge penetrate the human mind. We see now why this poor Indian looked somewhat apprehensive, but the effect does not as yet appear to be sufficient, so let's give him another treatment for good measure. For our last chapter, we will cross the Peruvian border into Bolivia to see a strange religious pageant, a Diablada, the dance of the devils. The colorful costumes, the intricate symbolism of this age-old ceremonial dance are extremely interesting to the traveler, who's fortunate enough to be a spectator, but it's difficult for even the trained archaeologist to follow the thread of the story. Preceded by a mysterious infant, an archangel and the chief of the devils gamble in, obviously on the best of terms, followed by sin and temptation and a wonderful retinue of lesser devils. These masks are among the most beautiful and imaginative in the world. I have never seen anywhere such genius for the grotesque, such vivid color. This spectacular pageantry provides a dramatic conclusion to our adventurous journey on wheels across the Andes. This picture shows me, Armand Dennis, and my wife, Michaela, back in Australia after our Bird of Paradise expedition to central New Guinea. We plan another ambitious journey across Australia from Adelaide on the southern coast through the central deserts to Darwin on the tropical coast of the north. The equipment? Dodge, of course. A good truck with its three-ton load of tents, camping gear, food supplies, cameras, and film. A power wagon, the best vehicle for desert and jungle, and a standard sedan for speed and comfort. All veterans of our journey to Cape York and of our film, Land of the Kangaroo. Soon we are on our way through the pleasant suburbs of Adelaide. 
Southern Australia has gracious ways of living, beautiful homes, lovely gardens. The gorgeous blooms of the Christmas bush, the many shades of gum blossoms are new to us. Even while we photograph these beautiful flowers, a honey eater appears, and we get our first bird pictures. In a brief 30 minutes, how could we show you more than a few aspects of Australia? We shall skip the great busy cities, the smiling countryside, the rich farmlands of the south. Let us make our first stop at a roadside pond, one of thousands swarming with unfamiliar wildlife. For ours is to be a naturalist's journey through a country which is a naturalist's paradise. inch lenses we photograph the shy lily hoppers. The lively birds feed on the insects and the many forms of life which cling to the stems and leaves of the water lilies. They have very large feet out of all proportion to their size to enable them to run safely on the surface of the leaves. Australia has immensely rich and varied bird life. Birds of all sizes, shapes, and colors. I can only give you a glimpse of a few. Among them, some of the most beautiful finches. And the richest collection in the world of parakeets, lorikeets, and parrots from the commonest and plainest to the rarest and gaudiest. with wildlife. The air above us is never empty. It is filled with the flight of birds of many species and colors.
caught a glimpse of a blue mountain parrot. Mikaela's sharp eyes have seen a baby bird fallen from the nest and helpless. pointed snout and fantastically elongated and agile tongue are for chasing ants in anthills. But we must introduce you to the most lovable of our Australian pets, a baby kangaroo. Much too young to be left without a mother, we found him shivering and lost after a torrential rainstorm. He took readily to Michaela as a foster mother and in a few days was weaned and learning to feed himself. Australians call baby kangaroos and baby wallabies joeys. We had photographed many wild kangaroos and we knew that a joey spends most of his time in his mother's pouch and this for many months. Our problem was to supply our little pet with a substitute for his mother's pouch. We imagined an apron with a big pocket in front. The little joey learned to answer to his name, Jumpy, Jumpy, to run or rather jump to his foster mother and to climb into his pocket home. Cozily curled up in his pocket, he was no very heavy burden to carry about and no trouble. not climb into the pocket unless Mikaela was actually wearing the apron. Later, he recognized the apron as his home. He dived in head first and curled up on his neck in the exact way in which joeys curl up in their mother's pouch. The central country, increasingly parched and desolate, often for many miles cursed with dust, we drive in choking clouds of fine abrasive powder. It penetrates our baggage, our clothes, even the mechanism of our precious cameras and sound recorders. Daily, the temperature exceeds 110 degrees, and the extreme dryness of the air causes a most painful irritation of the throat. We are entering the Gibber country, a flat wilderness of red sand, gravel, and stone. This is the desert. Near the water holes, long ago dried up, we pass many gaunt carcasses of the victims of thirst. There is no surface water left, only occasional salt pans. The fauna has become that typical of the desert. A skink, a lizard unchanged since 50 million years. This is a relic of Australia's ancient past, truly a living fossil. <laughs> Two male frilled lizards, so wholly absorbed in mutual defiance and combat that our arrival at first is not even noticed. My shadow disturbs them. One runs off, skipping legs, the characteristic gait of these frilled lizards. The other is unafraid and full of fight. But 
even the courage of a frilled lizard has its limits. No, it's not a snake. It is the Australian long-necked turtle, another of the local freaks. At last, the long desert crossing is behind us. We reach green trees and living things. The fantastic landscapes I have longed to see since first I read of the early explorers, of the McDonnell Range, and of Simpson's Gap. There are the huge monolithic domes, the highest, Mount Alga, towering 1,800 feet above the plains. Within hours now, we must arrive at the most spectacular wonder of Australia, Ayers Rock and most of the hardships of the transcontinental journey will be behind us. The first involuntary stop of our journey is within sight of our long-born objective, Ayers Rock. A bushel of seeds and dry grass clogging up the radiator. With today's temperature of 116 in the shade, it has been temporarily too much for the cooling system. What a tremendous impression Ayers Rock makes. A single lump of solid stone over two miles long, containing four billion tons of rock in the center of one of the most inaccessible areas on the Earth. Its walls rising sheer out of the plains, 1,100 unclimbable feet into the sky. with the wild aborigines, the very primitive people, said by anthropologists to be the most primitive people left on Earth, who still inhabit remote areas of the interior. Two abo hunters, as they would be called in Australia, led us, running ahead of the power wagon, much too afraid of it to accept a ride. We followed them for the better part of a day to where their tribe was temporarily hunting and living. We made friends with them through the children, as we always do with primitive peoples. They were very shy at first, and I made little progress. But Mikaela has a great gift, very valuable to me, of ingratiating herself with children and their mothers. She soon found herself invited to a turtle feast. Yes, the fiesta resistance was to be one of the long-necked turtles, a frequent item of aborigine fare. Mikaela found the going hard, and the conversation stilted, handicapped by the fact that she and her hostesses had not a word of language in common. As to the cooking of the turtle, it was dressed in a complicated manner before being covered with hot ashes and baked. Mikaela wrote it all down in her diary. The appetizing odors gradually loosened tongues and conversation became general before the turtle was fairly eaten. shaping a boomerang, a slow job of wearing away the hard wood, scraping off little shavings with the edge of a shell, which did not seem to be any too sharp. Mystery, how the apple knows the exact shape which will make for the most efficient throw and cause the weapon to return to the thrower. watching an old lady make some sort of a bag or a net. She makes the twine by rolling fibers together on her skinny old leg, and she forms stitches quite skillfully and evenly without a guiding tool of any sort. This bag was the most complicated object we ever saw the abos make.
shaggy mop of hair trimmed by singeing with a glowing bamboo comb. He also gets a shave. Notice, no brush, no soap, and no anesthetic. Most of the younger men are away hunting. The younger women collecting food. Only the less active older people are here, talking, telling stories of the past in the only written language they have, the language of pictures drawn in ashes or the sand. The only tools the abos have are of stone, crude rocks fastened with rosin to a wooden handle. Almost the only material they use is the soft bark of the dazzling white paper bark trees, which they use as dishes and as trays. Some of the boys have gone hunting on their own and are now beginning to return. This one with a speared river crocodile almost as big as himself. Two proud little kids with a wonderful bag, each a flying fox. The big fruit-eating bats are prized among the abos as great delicacies, and the little boys have done well. Soon a third flying fox is brought in. The older boys grab them and start a merry-go-round full of high spirits. But it's not long before the bats also are roasting in the ashes. have lost their shyness now. They turn out to be quiet, pleasant, and with instinctive good manners. A party of older boys is practicing spear throwing, already showing considerable skill and accuracy. wallaby on the fire, which one of them is speared. The wallaby game. This boy is the wallaby. The others play the part of the beaters and the hunters. Many of the boys' games are reenactments of hunting scenes. But for their favorite game, the boys work hard constructing a slide of slippery blue clay down the bank of the billabong. accompany the men on a wallaby hunt. The men are cutting new trails, but there is no hesitancy. We go some seven miles, then the hunters scatter. Some build crude blinds of branches. Wallabies appear indeed to be plentiful.
Four wallabies is the bag of the party I have followed. Others have gone spearfishing, but have not been very successful. Still others have gone after brogas. We see them return laden with the heavy birds. A small stick on a bed of dry wallaby dung, finely powdered. Another stick pointed, the point in a tiny dent. Now with great effort and pressure, the upright stick is revolved rapidly. I am seeing fire made, native Australian fashion. For a long time, nothing seems to happen, but the operator is visibly getting very hot. At last, a little smoke is seen. The wood has blackened. A spark is there. The spark is blown to a glow, to a flame. back to join Mikaela. She has gone with the young girls and the children to a clear, deep billabong. The kids are having a wonderful time. of Australia may be the most primitive people left on earth. We found them intelligent, quick, full of humor, and most pleasant to get along with. In most of Australia, of course, they have become civilized and progressed greatly under painstaking government guidance and assistance. But the most primitive of those we met were not the least likable. Watch these girls playing the game of cat's cradles. A game, by the way, which seems to be known and to be played in amazingly similar fashion by all the primitive peoples on Earth, from the Eskimos of the far north to the Bantus of Central Africa or the Abos of Australia. See these eager, serious faces, intent, sensitive, deeply human. We felt no sense of foreignness at all with these people. We greatly enjoyed the Abos, and we greatly liked them. We hated to leave them, and I like to think that they also remember kindly their visitors from the outside world. Quite a few months have passed, and our little Jumpy is becoming a problem child.
back to the table after everybody has left. No, that is not Jumpy's conscience giving him the reproachful look. Jumpy and Dingo are inseparable playmates. decided to make the attempt to cross the swamp. I remember this experience as one of the worst in my life. The sea deep slimy mud, alive with leeches and insects. The bruising tangled roots seeming to reach out from all sides, unyielding, and over each one of which we had painfully to struggle. The stifling heat, Heavy, steamy, like a hothouse. The swarms of mosquitoes and sand flies. And the stench, the stench of rotting vegetation mixed with the intolerable musky stench of the thousands of the giant bats. When at last we reached a clearing where the camera could be set up, we were near exhaustion. Climbing, fluttering, squabbling, turning upon us their intelligent black eyes, scratching their membranous wings and their furry yellow mantles with their uncanny claws. Back from Australia, seeing for the first time the pictures made during the trip, as I watched our Australian adventure unfold again before us on the screen, I kept waiting for these pictures of the flying foxes. They would have to be good to make me forget that eerie mangrove swamp. Well, here they are and I shall leave you to be the judge. Two days later, almost unexpectedly, we came to a road, and around the bend, the sea. We had completed our trans-Australian journey.